were starting with three memorial orations. The first memorial oration is uh, on the name of late Sayyid Nur Barsha Sheikh oration. Uh, I request the chairpersons, Dr. Morwani sir, Dr. Rajendra Akul, and Dr. Kameshwar Rao to take the chairs. I call upon Mr. Aman Sheikh to give this oration. I welcome and invite Dr. Arun Gadre sir. He will be speaking on hypermobile and membranous stapes foot plate syndrome, a new autology and management of persistent dizziness following head trauma. Please come, sir. First. I request uh, Mr. Aman to felicitate Dr. Arun Gadri, sir. Good evening, everyone. Today, that's the second day of COCON. This is the first time we are organizing the endoscopic ENT conference, which is based exclusively on the use of endoscopes. And this is the year we want to start the orations. And uh, we have started with three orations this year. And this will continue forever till the time uh, COCON will be um, organized by a CO, that is Society of Auto, uh, Endoscopic Autorhinolaryngologists. So the first oration is SBS oration. So this is basically, as you know, we are three uh, doctors, that is Dr. Mubarak Khan, Dr. Shireen Madam, Khansa's wife, and myself, Dr. Sapna Parab. Uh, these three orations are a lot of are having a lot of emotional attachments to us because we have started in the memory of our fathers. So. First one is in the memory of Shirin Madam's father, that is late Sayyid Noor Bacha Sheikh, SBS oration. So before starting with the oration, few words I would like to talk on behalf of Shirin Madam. Mr. Sayyid Noor Sheikh was born on 15th June 1938 in Tasgaon village in Sangli, Maharashtra. He went on to join the Indian Air Force aged only 21 in 1959. He married Mrs. Saida on 21st of January 1968. He served in the Air Force for almost two decades and was posted all across India during this time. He was a scholar in economics. All this time with the Air Force, he want, went on to join Telco as a floor manager, after which he assisted his son as a vendor for Tata Motors. A very peace-loving and a patient man, he was epitome of a gentleman. He was a strong follower of Vipassana and practiced meditation daily. He was a very disciplined man and followed his daily routine to the extent. He battled with three heart attacks, three heart surgeries and came out of it absolutely normal. He was a complete family man and show, uh, showered his family with abundant adoration and love. He unfortunately passed away on 24th of June 2022. That is just one and a half year back. 
while recovering from a leg surgery. He managed to leave a final permanent mark on all our lives as he donated his body to the Armed Force Medical College, Pune, so that all the students of AFMC could study. And that's really a very big thing because donating a body is a big gesture. He lived for and died for his loved ones. We miss him and hope he's watching and blessing us from above. So his full family has come over here along with Madam, uh, her maternal family is over here. So now I call upon Gadre sir to please speak a few words and then start with his oration. Thank you so much. So while they're uh, setting up the computer, uh, it just occurred to me as I was listening to that introduction of uh, a valiant Indian Air Force officer. When you say Sayyid Noor, I don't know how many of you understand the meaning of that word. And it also occurred to me at the same time that when he was 21 years old, I was just being born. So he's 21 years older than I am. So I, 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 get, I get how old he is. Uh, with those, so it's, first of all, it's, an very, uh, it's a tremendous honor for me. I did not realize how closely he was related to the Mubarak family and to the Sheikh family. They have been friends of mine for years. Uh, when I come to Pune, I invariably visit them, stay with them this time as well. I've always been the recipient of their hospitality. And uh, it is a pleasure to see you all sitting over there at the back, uh, including uh, her mother and sister, uh, the uh, Mubarak's mother and others. It is really to our mothers that we owe a lot. And I think it is uh, important for us to recognize that. The other thing I would like to say at the start is all of us have had teachers in our lives. We've had different kinds of teachers, right? Some of them we want to emulate. There are others who we fear. And then there's a third group who, who we'd rather not be. Even though during our lifetimes, we in front of them, we may say, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, right? Uh, if there's one person in the ENT community in Bombay who has driven all the distance from, from Bombay just to be here with us, uh, it is somebody whom I respect and love dearly, uh, who is sitting in front very quietly. Uh, he refused to speak at this meeting, and I wish he did. Uh, long after him, we will always remember him with fond affection and love, sir. I have something for you in my pocket. Uh, it may not be appropriate to give it at this juncture, but I will. Uh, I want you to have this, sir. Dr. Morvani has been one of those selfless individuals who has helped so many people 
at the start of their careers. When I was a young surgeon uh, just training in the United States and I came back to India, he was probably the only person who invited us to the Taj, my wife, myself, and my two little children uh, to the Taj for lunch. You'll remember this beautiful afternoon we've had and several after that. We miss, his, we miss Mrs. Morvani. She's no more with us. Uh, let me start off uh, with uh, this, the membranous hypermobile sleepy's foot plate syndrome. But first of all, what is it? I frankly don't know. And you'll see what I mean when I say I frankly do not know. This is a paper that I presented at the American Academy of Otolaryngology. I recently got inducted into the American Otologic Society. But one of the things that you realize as you go through your career is you know, I was asked by my chairman, uh, Dr. Kenneth Altman, the other day. We, he said, do you want to go to the Longhorn Steakhouse for lunch? He said, my wife is not in town. And I said, sure, let's, let's do it. So we went and had lunch. And he asked me, he said, you know, you're 64 years old and I'm 62 years old. What do you want your legacy to be? And I said, while I'm thinking about that question, I said, first of all, you're my chairman. Are you... Are you uh, making me a legacy already? Are you firing? Are you, am I losing my job at the Longhorn Steakhouse? And his answer was no. He said, I, he said, I've just been thinking about this a little bit because none of us live forever. And his answer, I said, let me ask you that question. What would you do? Or what do you want your legacy to be? And he said, well, all the patients I've treated in my life, all the papers I've written and the contributions I've made to the field, and I thought about that for a second and I, I looked at Ken and I said, Ken, you know, when you walk through the library, it's a very humbling experience, right? You say recent advances, 1932, even the silverfish do not want to visit it. Nobody's really even want you, nobody really cares. It was really important for that person at that point in time, but things are going to change. And so I think it is, it's a humbling experience to walk through a library. So I told him, the day I retire from Geisinger Medical Center, or which wherever I retire from, I hope nobody says he was a terrible fellow. Thank God he left. I think that would be a great legacy uh, where I'm concerned. Anyhow, so let's uh, go on from there. So this was an article that we published not very long ago in uh, the Frontiers in Neurology and Neurotology. Why Frontiers? Uh, it is because of a very close friend of mine uh, by the name of Ashley Wacken, and who is the chairman at Rutgers in New Jersey. And Ashley had just come back from a trip. And he said, you know, you presented this work in Rome at Maurizio Barbara's meeting. And you've not never, never really bothered or cared to publish it. Why not? And I said, well, I, I really should have long term results. That is the reason why I haven't published it. The other thing that happened was uh, Rick Cole, who was my teacher and mentor at University of California, Davis, told me that many careers have been, dis have been destroyed on an operation called patching of the, sp of, of the spontaneous perilum fistula. So I said, I do not want my career to be destroyed. And this is what he said. And Ashley came back and told me, he said, there is a fellow in Japan who has presented one case. If he gets that paper out before you, you will always be quoting him for the rest of your life. And you've been doing it for far more years than he has. So he said, so he was actually the reason why I sat down and put it to the, uh, to put my, my head to the grindstone and got, got the paper out. What is interesting is uh, the three other people in, who are my co-authors are not otolaryngologists, they are audiologists. And I think it's very important for us to realize the importance of audiology in our field, because a lot of what we do, we could not have done without their help. In fact, the person who clued me on this was the second author, Ingrid Edwards. And she now has a test uh, which you can find on YouTube called the rawlings Gatray test to try and diagnose this condition. So what, what exactly is it? Uh, acute dizziness of delayed onset is often associated with head trauma. So you can have a head traumatic event and the patient can then go on 
several weeks or months later to develop dizziness. The trauma is often trivial. It may or may not be associated with concussion or, unconsci or unconsciousness. There's no relief with conventional therapy. Most of these patients have benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. You do, do an epile maneuver once, you do an epile maneuver twice. It's on the right side once, it's the left side another time, and, and the patient keeps on feeling dizzy. Finally, you find there is no more benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, and the patient is still exceedingly dizzy. These patients are often labeled as having post-concussive syndrome or, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So that, those are the diagnoses. Uh, if I might interrupt, and if somebody get me a little glass of water, um, I'm starting to foam at the mouth. Uh, so the symptoms of this condition, thank you very much. Thanks a bunch. Uh, the symptoms of this, of this condition often overlap with uh, the superior semicircular canal syndrome of minor. The hearing may or may not fluctuate, so it starts looking a little bit like perilym fistula. There's vertigo, which is often severe. Their patients generally have an intolerance to sound. They will tell you that their horizon is not flat, but it is somehow tilted. They're unable to travel in planes or wherever there are large pressure changes going up the Empire State Building, for example. They also start complaining of cognitive issues and have otalgia. On clinical exam, other than a Siegel's pneumatic ot otoscopy, you really do not have much to go by. Audiology is often normal, caloric tests are inconclusive, and the VEM testing may or may not be uh, conclusive. But generally what we are looking for is a Hennebert sign, a Tulio test, where you give sound at 90, 95 decibels, and you can either have a sensation of dizziness or they have what is called an OTR, an ocular tilt reaction. And HRCT scan or high resolution CT scans or, or um, uh, micro CTs, wh whatever you want to do, are useful in making the diagnosis, in my opinion. Now let's look at this patient. Can we raise the volume? Is it coming up on the mic? Audio. Audio. Six, five, four. So, what is. Did you feel dizzy? No. Okay. What did you feel? Go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. She jerked again. Did you feel dizzy? No. Okay. What did you feel? You felt like you're getting pushed? Yeah. So she doesn't Just feel like... dizzy in the true sense of the term. She's not feeling as though her... So should we put that down or... Uh... Oh, these are the speakers. All right, I, I, can, I can turn it down. So she's not... She doesn't feel uh, dizzy in the truest sense of the word uh, as in a vertiginous spell with a rotatory symptom, but rather she ha has a feeling like somebody's held her and is pushing her. Um, so, uh, I'll, I'll show it to you again. Give me a second. So we, we have them as a distractor, have them, uh, count the numbers backwards so that their, their mind is off of their ear. So that's the reason why it's done that way. So, uh, how do you play it again? Yeah. There you go. You know what, if you can give me a, a microphone, a hand microphone, I can use that. Seven, six, five, four. Yeah. She jerked again. Did you feel dizzy? No. What, okay. What did you feel? You felt like you're getting pushed? Yeah. Just look. You want to see that again, uh, no. Dr. Morvani? Yeah. And yeah. nine, eight, seven, six, five. Or she jerked again. That's good. So, so let's let's uh, show you an illustrative case. So, there's a 36 year old gentleman who um, had a severe electric shock, uh, shock 
and fell about 20 feet at work. Uh, he was treated multiple times for benign proximal positional vertigo. And then on January 15th of 2023, he presented with zero improvement. He was vertiginous 85 to 90% of the time. He worked in a factory. He came home exhausted. He was on the verge of losing his job because of uh, you know time off from work. He complained of severe irritation to for and headaches uh, to light and sound and had, had cognitive issues at the time. And you'll see see what what happened when when you see his actual his picture in his video. Is uh, my initial notes had no surgery for this guy, right? Uh, then on a tone burst in the left ear, he all, when he stood on a balanced platform, it almost made the patient fall. His CT scans were reviewed by the neuroradiologist who reported, so I was wondering, does this guy have a superior canal dehiscence syndrome? So, you know, I asked for a high resolution CT scan of the temporal bone and uh, the patient was desperate. He wanted to try just about anything. He has been becoming suicidal. He can go out for a ride on a bicycle with his children. Uh, you know, all things that any father would generally like to do. This was what his uh, superior, so I, I was looking for a superior canal dehiscence, his, the bone over the superior semicircular canal right about there looks fairly solid. Um, and so we looked at his axial CT scan. So I started to look for, it's obviously behaving like a third window in some place. Well, where is it? And so when you look closely at his tapis foot plate, <clears throat> on the right side, you can see that the seventh nerve is out here, overlapping a little bit of the state east foot plate in the vestibule, the internal artery canal, the cochlea. And you can see a, a solid plate of bone on one side. If you look on the left side, you do not see a solid plate of bone. There it is. Those are magnified views of the same thing. In fact, if you take your cursor and look at the Hounsfield's units, it has almost the same consistency of the round window membrane itself. This is what his at surgery, his uh, state east foot plate looked like. You can see the seventh nerve. You can see uh, the long and lenticular process, the, the incus, and you can see the state east foot plate of the posterior crus right there with the quarter tympani nerve, um, you know, moved out of its way. This is, you, if you look, concentrate on this portion over here, and you will see it balot. Every time you push down on the posterior crus, of the, the, the stapes, the membrane itself has a tendency to bulge outwards. So I didn't know what to do. I've, I've never seen anything like it in my life. And I said, well, let's do something about this. If you see if it can fix it. So what I did was I roughed up the mucosa uh, around the oval window niche, around the round window niche, because I, I thought I was going to be dealing with a fistula is basically what I was thinking I was dealing with. I took a little lobule fat, it was already in my field, and I put it like a little sausage under the arch of the, uh, of the uh, uh, stapes. I packed a little bit of fat in front and a little bit of fat behind uh, the posterior cruise of the stapes. In other words, we tried to get that whole area somehow backed off thinking that I was dealing with a fistula. And this is the impression of the patient. What should I do? Put this down. Uh, I think this was working better than that. Should I do that? I can use this to this big right here. Would that be better? It should be. Yeah. All right. You should. Do you have to hold it? There you go. My kids. You you gave your kids the father back. So how how is your dizziness? Uh... It's it's gone. I mean, I can look up, I can look down. I'm able to get on a bicycle ride with my kids. And how long have you not been able to do that? Two and a half years. It's. I mean, I've not been able to do nothing. My kids have been without their father basically for two and a half years, and now you gave them back. Well, well, I think uh, I think you got to thank the big guy upstairs. <laughs> He had some, he brought me to you and well, thank you, you very fixed much. my problem. Well, thanks a lot. I'm glad to be of use. You, you, you don't know how much of a use you've been.
So thanks a bunch. Thank Pretty you. Good. So there you have it. I mean, you know, these are patients who are in desperate state. Uh, and, you know, when, when somebody initially, when I went and asked my assistant, I thought, here is a fellow who has been without a job for two and a half years, or he's been in and out of jobs. Uh, and you're always very worried about litigious issues in the United States. The moment he said, when he started to cry in front of me, and he said, Doc, you gave, you, gave my children your father back. I said, wait, 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 <laughs> let me video you now. <laughs> so so uh, you can, can we put that down? Let's put that down. Let's keep it down. Why are we changing that? Yeah. How, how is your business? And this will work too, right? Yeah, that's good. Oh, I see. So we don't need it. Okay. All right. You don't want to buy a second ride. How long have you not been able to do that? Two and a half years. So it, it was it is very interesting. There was another My kids have been without their father basically for two and a half years. All right. You gave their kids their father back. Okay, we're done with so that. So how, how was your business though? It's it's gone. I mean, I can look up, I can look down. All right. Now, one of the things as we pride ourselves in everything that we do, right? <laughs> We say, oh, I'm such a great surgeon. I did this. I, you know, one of the things you realize as you go through life is if you've not had a complication, you probably haven't operated enough. There's another group of surgeons whom I call outstanding surgeons. They stand outside of the operating room and they talk, right? Those are what I call outstanding surgeons. So it's not a compliment, right? But when you, when you see, when you see uh, Prabhakaran's uh, uh, talk, and he shows you the bleeding and he shows you how a low pressure system can be controlled. It's profuse. The, 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 the flow rate is really high, but the pressure is low and how, how it can be controlled with gel foam as opposed to a carotid bleed, which I've had, uh, it's quite, it's a, it's a whole different kettle of fish. So you've got to realize that and it's, it's extremely important for us at meetings such as this to talk about our complications. So this is a patient who had a, what I thought was, initially I always thought that these patients all had uh, perilymph fistulas. That's, that, was, that was my working hypothesis, was a perilymph fistula. And so what I did was I was, I had put the scope on, there's a change in shift of the nurses and somebody turned, went and turned my xenon light source to 100%. The rule is we don't go above 50 look what happens and and you know it's it's fine to blame the nurse who you know it should, it is your responsibility as does that surgeon in the room you are the captain of that ship you are the commander you cannot turf it on somebody you have the one who is be, going to face that patient and so it's vitally important and and, and the reason i i actually put this video in about two minutes ago in my room, because somebody said that there are no complications from endoscopic light, from, from endo endoscopic surgery because of heat. No, there is injuries. And I wanted to show you one of my cases. All right. So this is, I was looking for a perilymph fistula. I was at the University of Louisville as, a, uh, as an endowed chair at the time. I was looking down, you can see the facial nerve. Look what's happening to the cord as I'm looking at that nerve. Bef so I'm concentrating on the stapes foot plate. I don't even notice what's happening over here. You know how many seconds that is? If you measure, 15 seconds. Put a xenon light source. So you, it's important for you to understand and to, to know your equipment. You can't blame somebody else for it. This is my case, all right? So be very, very careful. This patient, uh, her vertigo resolved, but she had taste disturbances and uh, she couldn't be bothered by it. I was lucky. But somebody else, I mean, just imagine if, if it's somebody in, in um, uh, you know, where you are from, where, where their profession depends on on the notes in the vine, I mean that would, or or in Napa in California, I mean that this would this could be career ending. So it's vitally important for us uh, to think about these things. Here is our. This is from two universities, major university centers. There are not that many cases. 
we've uh, find we you know we did 33 patients. We had 40 years. Those are the age ranges. Uh, that is the male to female relation relationship. And 64 percent at last count had a history of concussion or loss of consciousness. Uh, all all patients had a positive either a Tulio and or Hennebert test, and that shows you you know bilateral unilateral. Well, what does all of that mean? So. It, I mean, I can show you the data that the data is published uh, in the frontiers. You're welcome to take a look at that. This is what it looks like. Very little to understand in that, right? I can't even read it. And it's it's designed on purpose to, to do that because I want to fudge my data. No, we will tell you exactly what it is. So 65% of those patients had defects in the stapes foot plate, which was covered by a membrane. But what I found interesting were the last two numbers. 70% approximately who had intact stapes foot plate showed leaks, whereas very few of those who had membranous stapes foot plates showed any leaks. So what does that mean? The question is, is there some sort of an avascular necrosis that is taking place? They have a delayed effect, and that's a theory that I have. I don't know if it's true or not, but one has to consider why is this happening, all right? So if the stapes foot plate is solid, there's a higher chance that you will find fluid welling out of the oval around window. Our follow-up results was at that time, six months to seven years. Uh, we did have four cases who failed surgery for reasons I do not know, uh, and no case had any drop in hearing. That is another thing that I was concerned about was if you're loading the, the stapes and you're loading the oval and round windows, well, what does it do to hearing when you check them at about three months? And it appears as though it does not change. Now, let's talk a little bit about the surgery itself. The issue of perilium fistulas, particularly spontaneous ones, traumatic, yes, but spontaneous ones are, is fraught with a lot of con controversy. What is the controversy? Uh, John, so there were people who were doing for any case of vertigo in the United States, there were people who were going and patching fistula. You had John Shea, who came out with a paper in uh, the uh, in the White Journal in otolaryngology head neck surgery, and he said, in my opinion, the myth of spontaneous perilymph fistula has become a cancer eating into the credibility of otolaryngology. This is a rather stark and very, very strong statement coming from a person of uh, who's highly respected. And so this operation, basically, people were doing it. I think there were a few people in the country, the people in uh, Oregon, John Epley in particular, who was still doing the operation. Dr. Brown was still doing the operation in Oregon. So it was sort of spotty. Fitzgerald in Washington, D.C. was still doing the operation. But... By and large, at most of the large university centers, this operation died. So I went and looked at the literature. I said, let me, because Rick Cole had told me that, you know, lots of careers have been sacrificed on the altar of perilymph fistula surgery. So I said, let me look at the literature. And this is what I found. University of Iowa, 175 operations with Brian McCabe as the author. Stanford experience, uh, Shelton and Simmons, 78. Houseier Institute was 86 operation. Look at the experience for, for uh, uh, Meyerhoff, 120 operations. So obviously they were doing a large number of these surgeries. Black got into a big controversy at the time uh, on perilymph fistulas. There were threatened lawsuits that never happened, but whatever. So. First of all, you had very, very credible people who are doing these operations. I don't think it, it takes you 120 operations at, uh, at Southwestern to determine that this operation doesn't work. I think if, if it's not working, it's not working. You, you know that pretty early on. So you have some very credible surgeons on both sides of the argument. The symptoms of superior semicircular canal dehiscence, perilymph fistula, vestibular migraine, and so on and so forth, there's a considerable amount of overlap, the arguments start to get polarized. There is a saying, my father used to say this, that our strongest opinions are the result of our worst experiences, right? 
So our strongest opinions are often the result of our worst experience. And then we start becoming really dogmatic and hardened in our views. Uh, people cease to question dogma. There's fear of repercussion from the peer group. Perhaps some did have superior canal dehiscence because at the time when that operation was being done, superior semicircular canal dehiscence was not being diagnosed. Uh, but there could be another reason, and that other reason is perhaps a membranous state is foot late, like the one I mentioned. Once you get into that situation, then you ask yourself the question, well, why is it happening? There's a paper that I found that uh, Bacchus had written in 99, where he had looked at 130 temporal bones, and he found that some of these patients had had adhesions between the stapes foot plate and the utricle. So in other words, is there a floppy foot plate that is now because of trauma, because of adhesions, because of very uh, uh, saccular hemorrhage or whatever, causing some sort of a contact between the two that's stimulating the end organ? We really don't know. I found one paper in the literature by Dietrich uh, from Germany, and she described a patient who was a trumpet blower, who had perhaps an event while he was blowing his trumpet, where she described an ocular tilt reaction in these patients with skew deviation of the eye and a balanced platform test. So it's a paper worth noting. And she mentioned something that she called silicone sponge that was used in the oval window, which appeared to cure the patient. So there was one case report that I did find and we quoted in our paper. Now, so that I think, so now the question then is, what is that fat doing there, right? So that's the, that's the next question. So are we somehow changing the impedance of that membrane? Perhaps we are. Are we causing a little more scarring? Is there uh, uh, stem cells in the fat like we, we know they exist that is causing problems? We really do not know what the mechanism is. But this is a statement that was done by Dr. Miyamoto. Uh, Dr. Miyamoto was a, is a very famous otologist, a neurotologist house trained at the University of Indianapolis. And this is his audiologist. <laughs> she had come to intern with us. She had been to, had, had, had a bad car accident. And she was one of those who, whose impressions I thought are perhaps uh, most important for you to hear. So, so can you tell me what your symptoms before you had your surgery? Before surgery, I would just get dizzy randomly throughout the day. I could tell like concentration was even down. I just always felt off. Um, any type of pressure change, like just changing like slight elevation, I could tell and I would have pain in my ear. Um, and since the surgery- What about loud sound? Oh, loud sounds, yeah. When we would- did like the Tulio test, any type of reflexes, even getting an ear mold impression, any loud sound or pressure in my ear, I would get dizzy. And this was only the right ear? Or? Yeah, only the right ear. And then what operation did we do for you? Um, you did a repair of the paralymph fistula and you actually filled in both the round window and the oval window. Yes, correct. Yeah. And, 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 and what are your, you were telling me something about your experience after the surgery? Oh, I've, I haven't been dizzy at all, like <laughs> at all. Um, I get no pain even going up like in the mountain in Brown County. I don't get any pain where before I would I get a lot of pain in the right side. Um, I haven't been dizzy at all. I just feel like very, like everything is clear. Like there's no fogginess that I used to feel. Well, my concentration is back. It's not, I'm having a better time remembering things really yes so, so cognitively you think that that has made a big difference oh yeah that. I was doing my final year of school and just remembering patient information would be I would listen to them and then five minutes later I was like having difficulties remembering it but now it's so much better great I'm happy <laughs> uh what what about what about you said that you you know you're an audiologist and mm -hmm. you you tried some uh uh pressure tests on yourself yes and Tell I know about that so I did a tympanogram on myself today, and I did not get dizzy at all. <laughs> what about before? Before I would get dizzy. <laughs> yeah. Get pretty... Yeah, it would just be like everything would just like move. Not necessarily the room is spinning, but I would just get like the lightheadedness, and I feel like my vision would kind of 
weeble wobble. <laughs> I see. Okay. Well, thank you very much. What so they so they don't tell you that it's spinning, but they say um, it's weeble wobbles. Well, like six weeks when I was doing the drops, I couldn't hear out of my right ear. Um, but hearing tests yesterday that I had someone do on me was all normal. I feel like it's normal. Okay, great. So so this feels like like it was before. Yeah. So the hearing feels pretty normal now. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So in conclusion, then, most cases do not have true perianth leaks. Most cases have a membranous or what can be classified as a hypermobile stapes foot plate. You do, do need to have a high index of suspicion. Um, and, you know, I routinely do Siegel's pneumatic otoscopy on all these patients. I think it's an important thing to do. Now we have a test where we put the patient on a balanced platform. We put, uh, we uh, deny vision and pressurize the ear at the same time. Oftentimes, these patients don't even feel they're getting pushed, but sometimes they tend to bounce up and down. And I don't understand why that happens, uh, but uh, so that is uh, known as the rawlings gadry test. Um, the invert function on HRCT scan, we had a, a paper that was recently published in the annals uh, of uh, uh, otology, laryngology, and rhinology, which uh, uh, shows the importance of using the invert function on your on your uh, PACS system. If you hit the invert function, even for when you have the questions of, you know, is there a superior canal dehiscence or not? You hit the invert function and the white bone becomes like a black line and you know it's thin, but it's still, there's still bone present. Uh, patching with connective tissue appears uh, to help in a majority of cases. We do have the mystery of the four cases that failed. In conclusion, uh, you know, William Osler said, if you listen carefully Hello. to the patient, they will tell you the diagnosis. Um, and uh, the philosopher Arpen Schopenheimer said, and this is important here, it's very poignant for a meeting such as this, where we are talking about endos endoscopic uh, ear surgery and endoscopic surgery in general, that all, pa all truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. And uh, I'm sure you remember that meeting in, uh, in, 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 uh, where both of us were present in Japan, uh, where two very prominent otolaryngologists shouted at each other uh, in a rather unprofessional manner. Uh, it was one of the most embarrassing meetings I've ever attended. Um, and, and he's smiling. Uh, it, 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 but, but those are the kind of things that happen. So all truth, it says, passes through three, three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. And third, it is accepted as being self-evident. So with those uh, few words, I shall end my talk. Before I get off this uh, stage, I'd like to thank the Mubarak family and the Sheikh family for making this. And I do hope and pray that uh, this will be the start of a tradition uh, going for as long as there is this meeting. So thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Gadre, sir. Very good. So his question is that, you know, when we spoke sure. about Hennebert Hello. test and Tulio test, it is uh, 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 associated with congenital syphilis. That is true. And uh, you know why, why that is. Do you know why that is? The, the, so I, I found an old book in the library called Syphilology. Can you imagine a whole book about about a thousand pages uh, with, with big illustrations written in 1900 called Syphilology. That is the name of the book. And apparently what happens is you get an osteitic change in the bone. So you have so that's the reason why you have midline ulcers and so on and so forth in syphilis is it's an avascular necrosis. Therefore, therefore you have the painless ulcers in the mouth, right? It's only when they get infected that they become painful with, with syphilis. So the thought is, is there a gammatus 
uh, change in the bone uh, uh, of the uric capsule itself, that, that is the cause of it. So that's, that's theoretical. The problem is when you had uh, syphilis before penicillin, you did not have CT scans. So perhaps what we should do is we should look at Bruner's collection or one of the older temporal bone collections to see if the syphilis cases, what, what, was, the, what was the pathology in the uric capsule? Those, those specimens are, are available. Okay, so now to, for me to start ordering uh, Wasserman reactions and, 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 and uh, 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 VDRL tests on, on, on a patient like this, or a con, a con test on patients like this is probably ridiculous, particularly when there's an event such as uh, a, a trauma that initiated the vertigo or the dizziness, right? So that's why, I, 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 now, could these guys have, uh, tertiary syphilis, all of them? I would think not, not in the American context. Congenital, you, you think these guys have congenital syphilis? I, I mean, have you seen a saddle? Have you seen a congenital syphilis case? Do you know what it looks like? I have. Uh, do they, they generally will have a saddle depression of the nose. I mean, there are other signs of congenital syphilis. This is not congenital syphilis. I'm sorry, sir. Thank you, sir. That that lady was not operated on. She was not operated on. The, the, that was on the on the right side was the the lesion, the, the the pressurized side. But that lady, so that is one of the reasons why if you see this, don't rush them into surgery. Okay, wait. It's it's okay to give, put them on a labyrinthine sedative. It's okay to give them meclizine. It's okay to give them whatever else, dramamine, avomine, give them whatever you want to give. It's not necessary. That that lady responded. She this was acutely within a week after her accident that that happened. But the reason I videoed it is to show what kind of a response you get. Now, that lady was when I was in San Diego. So she, she went on to respond in three months. She said, you know, I called her for a follow-up. She said, I have no symptoms. You don't have symptoms, don't, get, don't have surgery. Simple. Thank you, sir. Uh, I request uh, Murwani, sir. Honor, Dr. Gatre, sir. Thank you, sir. We move to the next memorial oration. And for this session, I request Dr. Ramesh Rohiwal and Dr. Sanjay Sonore to take the chairs as chairpersons. This memorial oration is in the name of late Mr. Mohammed Suleiman Khan. I call Asim on the stage. The lecture will be delivered by Mr. Pre Dr. Prepagaran. Please come in the center. I don't think there is need to introduce Asim. He is Mubarak's son. He is entering into the medical field day after tomorrow. He has got admission to which college? Okay, great. At Mangalore, he will be there. So welcome him. Yeah, this. Dr. Propagaran, please come on the stage. Photo. Center, center. Ikram Madhe. I request Dr. Sapna to say a few words about late Mr. Mohammed Suleiman Khan. Dr. Sapna.
late Mr. Mohammed Suleiman Khan, father of Dr. Mubarak Khan, migrated from the deep village of Kerala. He was a common man who struggled very hard to settle in the city of Maharashtra, that is in Satara. He was absolutely a passionate human being and tried his best to teach the extreme survivals to his son. Okay. He was a passionate human being and tried his best by doing extreme survival to see his only son to become a doctor who is a renowned Dr. Mubarak Khan. And Dr. Mubarak Khan, as we all know him, he has studied from GMC Miraj. Doc, Mr. Mubarak uh, Muhammad Suleiman Khan, who was a progressive homo sapien in the early 1980s, he inculcated a wide spectrum of beautiful life in his son by instigating to read all the holy books, that is Bhagavad Gita, Bible, Quran, Swami Vivekananda, and J. Krishnamurti. And all of you must have witnessed this in his son, Dr. Mubarak Khan. This memorial is started in the memory of Mr. M. S. Khan, that is this. I call upon Professor Prepa to talk about it. Yes. Namaste. When I first found out that the oration I was giving was uh, in memory of uh, Professor Mubarak Khan's father, I had uh, I had tears in my eyes because usually most of the orations that I've given so far has always been in the name of ENT surgeons who have contributed a lot to their, their society. It's one of the first times that, probably the first time I'm giving an ovation to the in honor of the father of a very close friend. And it reminded me of, uh, of of how I grew up as well, uh, a very simple beginnings, and it's my father's dedication and determination that's made me stand here. So I pray that he will find a place among the virtuous, and rest in peace. So I'm going to be speaking about endoscopic otology surgery, and I must admit from the very beginning itself, I'm an accidental endoscopic otology surgery. Some of you know that I do a lot of uh, endoscopic sinonasal skull base, and I do lateral skull base as well. So it is very convenient for me. As a default, I went into endoscopic ear surgery simply because I was so comfortable with the endoscope doing sinonasal and skull base, and I knew the anatomy of the lateral skull base very well. So it was by default. So I have no formal training at all in endoscopic otology in any way. But for the last 10 years or so, I have not used a microscope to examine an otology patient or do any procedure in the clinic without, in, or with a microscope. It's always, always been with an endoscope. That's how comfortable I was with the endoscope. And this is how we started. We started with a literature review and came up with the levels of, of, uh, of skills in otology. Level one, clinic. Number two, level two, simple malingotomy gourmet. Level three, malingoplasties, that procedure is confined into a tympanic membrane. Level three, procedures that are, level, that are confined into the middle ear space. And level four, procedures that is beyond the middle ear space. And level five will be the inner ear and skull based procedures. So we came up with this, tra this, this uh, training module or levels of endoscopic ear surgery in 2017. So I started doing endoscopic uh, ear cases the other way. I started doing level four and going forward because, endos because tympanoplasty and mangoplasty, all my colleagues were doing it with a microscope and everyone was very comfortable. So I started doing this glomus cases and so on endoscopically. And then I went into tympanoplasty and mangoplasty. I went the reverse direction simply because I was very comfortable with the endoscope doing skull base, and I was comfortable with anatomy. So this is the first few cases that we did. And this is the first case that I did, um, 2018. 
So again, you can see, this, again, it was in another hospital. And until now, we just got our endoscopic ear set. All this while I've been operating all my endoscopic ear cases with, with normal endoscopic middle ear set. Um, again, as I said before, I have no formal training in endoscopic ear. And so whatever I do is purely common sense, which is common, which I think for me anyway is common, is common sense, yeah? So that's, that's the glomus that has been exposed. You can see the edema in the middle ear space. And all we need to do is to elevate the glomal tumor from the promontory. That's always a plane. And once you have in the plane very nicely, you can actually elevate the tumor up, as you can see. Now, the feeding vessel is always down. Now, if I've had Mubarak Khan's endo holder, I would have been able to cauterize this vessel. But this was 20, 2018, I didn't. So when I let this go, there comes the bleeding. You saw this yesterday anyway, right? So what I did, all you need to do is put a cotton ball and then dissect into the promontory. That means you go between the tumor and the promontory, dissect it away, and you can see the enclosed joint here. And then that gives you the ability to mobilize and remove the tumor. And then with a the monopolar suction here, we cauterize the origin of a tumor. And I always leave the opening open, at least for three, four years, so that if the tumor recurrence, you can always see it instead of doing a tympanoplasty and then depending on the imaging for you to see a recurrence. And after three, four years, if the tumor recurs, it does not recur, then we do a tympanoplasty. That will take away the need for you to do a CT scan, or, which, is, which costs money and unnecessary radiation. Uh, another glomus tympanicum that we did, infiltration. This was 2021 in July. You can see the tympanum middle flap being raised, uh, lifting up the tympanum middle flap. That's the glomus tympanicum nicely visualized. It's like a balloon filled with blood. Again, lift up the tumor. And you can, in this case, we could actually see the feeding vessel. Can you see the feeding vessel, guys? I'll show you again the feeding vessel. So if your bipolar works, it's beautiful. There you go. See? The bleeding stops. <laughs> That's the feeding vessel there. And then by using irrigation, it actually helps to see the anatomy very nicely. The round window, you can see the facial nerve, stapedius tendon, the foot plate. Step, and then we are able to there's, there's usually some amount of blood supply coming from the front as well. And then you can easily dissect the tumor away from the eustachian tube and dissect the anterior part from the attachment to the, from the tympanic membrane. And then the tumor comes out very nicely as well. The good thing about this glomus case is because you're doing endoscopically, it takes you less than half an hour. There's no incision to make, there's no incision to close, and you get a very good view as well. Um, so, so this is the, and look at the anatomy that you get with infiltration, with, sorry, with the washing that you get, you take away all the blood. You can see very nicely the, the anatomy in the middle ear space. You will not be able to get such dynamic movements, anatomy, by using a microscope. The, the foot plate, the facial nerve, the stapedius tendon, the pyramid, you can actually see the annulus around the foot plate as well. And this is the view that you get after the surgery, eustachian tube, and as you can see here. Another case of paraganglioma, this was 2019, a patient who came with a facial nerve palsy and a tumor that was going all the way from the eustachian tube promontory. And this is the video before surgery. So when I saw this case, I was okay. We are going to have a blood bath again today. And by now, you should know that I'm I, quite a big chunk of my life is spent looking at blood. If you've seen my other presentation so far. So again, infiltration. I'm going to go a bit quickly in view of time. And again, elevation. Elevation itself, you start bleeding. By pottery works, I'm able to elevate and expose the tumor. And you know the tumor was actually bulging out of the tympanic membrane. That's the, the tympanic membrane being dissected out of the tumor. There's no way you can preserve the tympanic membrane. That's the gel, that is the cotton ball going between the promontory to dissect the tumor out. 
Uh, and that's again the tumor being dissected from the promontory. And when the bipolar works, you are able to cauterize the bleeding quite nicely and dissect. So now we have removed the majority of the tumor as well. What we need to do now is to find and identify the facial nerve and decompress the facial nerve. Let me just go straight. I'm going to remove and curate the tumor at the attic region. That gives us the exposure of the tumor in the attic. So now we're going to remove the tumor in the attic and the incus so that the attic is nicely exposed. And now we are looking at the tumor around the stapes and we need to remove the tumor from the sinus tympani region. So again, you will find at this time, I do not have an endoscopic ear set. I was still using a normal middle ear set. Round window coming into view. Now the tumor is all, that's the facial nerve being decompressed. Tumor all around the stapes. So now we have to remove the tumor around the stapes. Now this is not easy because this is not a patient with otosclerosis. It's a patient that the stapes is normal. So we need to remove as much tumor as possible from the pyramid as the tumor being sucked out from the stapes tendon and dissect it away from the foot plate, knowing full well there's always a chance that the foot plate might just come out with a suction. And then the facial nerve being decompressed as well. So this is the final view of the surgery. Tensor tympani tendon, facial nerve decompressed from one to two, stapedius tendon, and the stapes that is intact, a bit of tumor going between the, the crura, which I just left it alone. The enemy of good is perfection. If you've done a good job, don't try to be perfect and dislocate the stapes. Yeah? The facial nerve uh, responded eight months down the line. This was a paraglangloma, vascular paraglangloma. Then we started doing an endoscopic CSF, I'm sorry, a lateral semicircular canal fistula. You can see very nicely in the scan, the lateral semicircular canal. And that's the preoperative view. You can see the keratin at the, uh, at the attic region, the infiltration of local anesthesia. I'm going to show you step by step of the surgery, the elevation of the tympanometal flap, the cora tympani, that's the scutum that's being elevated there. And by using a pick, we are able to dissect the tympanic membrane. And that is the colostoma that is inside the, uh, the posterior part of the past tensor as well. That's called someone being dissected out. We are using a pick to do this entire dissection and at the same time, elevate the tympano metal flap so that we are able to see into the middle ear space itself. And the next step would be to do an ethicoentrostomy by using a curette to remove. At this time, I did not have a bird that was small enough to drill the, the ear. We just got a, a, a bird of two millimeters diamond that uh, this is by using the long shaft, so it is not an endoscopic ear burr. We are using a normal burr, but the shaft is long so that we are able to drill. And after that, the attic is exposed. We are able to dissect the attic colostoma from the attic and then dissect the colostoma from the anteriorly. as well as dissect the costuma posteriorly as well. So we need to find the posterior edge of the costuma as we dissect. And now we are coming to the lateral semicircular canal region. And the move and the dissection of this exposes the lateral semicircular canal region as well. So here we can see, and this is the inner part of the costuma from the antrum that we are, we are sucking out with a curved sucker. So this is the view that we get, the stapes foot plate, the coda tympani, the facial nerve that is decent, there's the facial coda tympani, and the facial nerve that is decent. And you can see a large defect along the, lat along the lateral semicircular canal. So there are two ways of doing this. Some people will say, just make it a cave or just uh, resurface it, but the, it's too big. It's whatever you do, whatever bone, whatever you put on top, it's just gonna crumble and block the entire way. So I just blocked it with a bone wax that filled up the entire cavity. Then I put a fissure on top of it because I don't think it's possible in my hands anyway, in my rhinologist's 
open lateral skull base hand with no endoscopic ear training to be able to resurface the lateral canal. And I just put a fascia on top of it. And on top of this, and I left the cavity open. She's a staff nurse in a nearby hospital. The nystagmus went away, the vertigo went away, and she's quite well. And the beauty about this entire surgery is because there is no incision, there is nothing to close. The surgery is done in less than, 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 than one hour. Then we went on to do a CI, cochlear implants. So we also do exoscopic like, like Daniel, and uh, we, we use the VTOM of the STOS system. And we have already published, I think we were among the first few to do uh, exoscope without a microscope. And this was published, we, we did both the three-dimensional exoscope system for the bilateral symmetrical cochlear implant. And we also did a 2D exoscope system uh, in, in, in a bilateral cochlear implant. And this is how the system works. And this is the microscope. The entire surgery is performed with this simple exoscope and looking at the camera system. This is a 2D exoscope. And this is the exoscope that we use and with the 3D glasses. We all look like pop stars, rock stars with the 3D glasses, as you can see. And it's uh, a very nice feeling because you can move your neck, you can turn around, it's like riding a Harley David, David uh, motorbike on the Pune Mumbai Highway because you are not confined by the microscope in any way. Let me show you a complex cochlear implant case. There's some multiple surgeons in my, my country, and all of them said you cannot do cochlear implant. So the mother came to us. She was funding the implant on its own because the government didn't want to fund an abnormal child. The mother was very committed, and I just told her, look, I'll try, no promises. Uh, and this, look at the scans, then maybe you'll understand why the other students don't want to do. So this is a child who, who is 14 years old, learning difficulties there. The, the, the sigmoid sinus and the brain is literally along the ear canal. Can you see? There is no mastoid cavity at all. That's the attic. That's a sigmoid sinus with part of the brain. There's no mastoid cavity at all a huge uh, emissary vein is going backwards. That's the ear canal. That's, the cochlea is completely normal, but there's not a single mastoid air cell. There's a mastoid tip, but not a single mastoid air cell. All you have is a sigmoid sinus sitting all the way here. So I told the, the mother that we can't do a uh, mastoidectomy. So what we did was we did an endoscopic assisted, this was 2017. So this is the view with an endoscope inside. Again, you can see the ossicles are abnormal and there's no cochlea, there's no round window whatsoever. So I use the lentiform process to make the mark of an opening for the cochlea, for the cochleostomy, and then inserted the electrode endoscopically as well. And this is the insertion of the electrode endoscopically. You get a very nice view. And then I made a groove along the canal. But the problem with this is there's always a chance of extrusion. Not two years, not three years, even 10 years down the line. So I put bone pate on top of it. And to double enforce it, I put a fascia as well. To fascia complete, to cover the groove with a bone pate and the fascia on top. And then put the tympanometal flap on top of it. Uh, and this is a six weeks post-op. It's been almost five years now. He's still well. And I hope he, when it extrudes, I've already retired. Uh, so far, he's doing quite well. This is the post-op view, post-op uh, aided audiogram. He's able to listen up to 30 decibels. And this is how he looks like in real life, able to go back to school. Case number two. Again, another endoscopic assist, assisted cochlear implant. Same procedure as well. We use a monopolar to do an opening. Uh, open up the, the post-audicular incision, elevate the middle ear space along the ear canal. We've only done two so far, and I'm still waiting to see how the results are before we proceed. The, the main concern we have is the migration of the electrode. So once we have elevated the tympanum middle flap, this is the view that you get. And then what we need to do is to make drill a little bit of a recess along, along the annulus. 
so that you can see this view very nicely as you can see. But now I don't want to make a groove anymore. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to recess a tunnel. I'm going to drill to a, uh, an opening along the cortex and measure the drill so that the electrode goes through a bony ledge and come out just above the annulus, as you can see here. Therefore, this is the only part that I will have to put a bone pate on top so that it does not, does not extrude. So once that is done, I now have a nice tunnel from the mastoid itself. So this is the anatomy of the middle ear space. You can see the kind of view that you will get with an endoscope, with a cochlea. Now we're going to use a drill and drill the round window niche until we are able to identify the round window membrane. So here you can see the membrane opened up. There's a round window membrane that has been flipped open and now you're able to see into the, uh, into the non window membrane. That's the implant going in. That's the tunnel so that the electrode is actually under the bone all the way except for the tip. And now we are able to use a crocodile and push the electrode inside. Again, the beauty about this is because you don't have to do a cortical mastoidectomy, the surgery is actually quite fast. It's less than half an hour because there is no mastoidectomy performed at all. And full insertion, and uh, that's the full insertion as you can see. But the most important part, again, this part is exposed, the rest is in the tunnel. So what we worry about is the migration. So we use, again, a bone patty cover the whole area before we place the tympanometal flap. And that's the view of the obliteration. So the, this has been two, three years now. The patient is still quite well. There's no migration whatsoever. This is a patient that I did just six weeks ago. It was a patient with an extractive petrous apex colostoma that was stuck to the dura, ICA, and the IAM. I'm going to play the scans and you'll understand what I mean by uh, that it's quite extensive. Previous surgery done before. If I remember correctly, it's on the right side. Again, this is the jugular bulb. That's the ICA. The ICA is coming upwards. That's the middle ear space, eustachian tube, tympanic membrane. As we go higher, you will find sigmoid sinus, jugular bulb, cochlea. That's the carotid artery. That's the colostoma. Just in front of the cochlea, touching the carotid artery from the vertical to the horizontal segment. And as I go forward, there's two separate colostomas here. One in front and one along the petrous apex. Go higher, colostoma is actually going around the petrous apex, one in front, one above the cochlea, filling up the entire petrous apex close to the facial nerve here, as you can see, filling up the petrous apex, IAM. That's a normal IAM, touching the IAM. The IAM is virtually compressed. And then here, as you can see, dura, exposed middle cranial fossa, and the posterior cranial fossa. So by, and these are the images that is relevant. Colostoma, 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 petrous apex, middle cranial fossa gone, Colostoma, petrous apex. So this is just near the cochlea. The patient had a facial nerve, house backman tree, and he had a mixed sense, mixed sense, mixed hearing loss. By right, so we gave him the options of a sub uh, total petrosectomy. He refused. He says he does not want his ear to be closed. Malaysians are can be difficult. I don't know whether he had a problem or not, but it can be difficult. So this is unedited video because I didn't even have time to edit it. So what I do is instead of recording the whole, instead of recording the whole surgery, can I pass this to you? Um, what I do, I just say start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. That's why all my videos are small, small, unedited videos. Because when I put all the videos together, even at my stage in life, I get confused. So this is unedited video. So this is a preoperative video, as you can see, preoperative view. It's a mastoid cavity, and that's the colostoma. Sorry? Uh, sorry, I thought you were talking to me. There's a preoperative view, as you can see. 
So the next thing we want to do, again, this is a pre, it's an un unedited video. So you're seeing exactly live as, as if I'm doing it in front of you, yeah? So what I need to do now is to find the plane. I'm not in the plane yet, but that is the plane. I'm not operating in my hospital. So all the instruments we use are a middle ear set, not endoscopic ear set. That's the dewer. So that's the tumor being peeled, clostomod is being peeled from the middle cranial fossa dura here. So I didn't do the first surgery. The first surgery was done by a local surgeon. So I'm doing a revision, revision surgery. It's no fun doing a revision surgery because you have no idea what is where. So that's the clostomod that is being removed from the middle cranial fossa dura. Can you see the screen? So, so now I'm going to, let me go a bit quickly, yeah? So I'm going to dissect and remove the tumor from the middle cranial fossa dura, as you can see. And that's the middle cranial fossa dura. Then I'm going to dissect it along, remove whatever remnant from the middle cranial fossa dura. The next step is to dissect it from the middle ear space. Middle cranial fossa dura, that's the labyrinth that is, that is preserved uh, from the previous surgery. And I'm going to dissect it by from a decent facial nerve, which I didn't know it was decent until I removed the colostroma anyway. That's the facial nerve coming into view. Tensor tympani tendon, facial nerve, which is decent all the way up to the first genu. And that the colostroma is being removed. So this is only the first part of the colostroma. So now, the view I get after removing the middle ear colostroma, that's the dura. That's the decent facial nerve, tensor tympani tendon, eustachian tube. Where is the colostoma in the petrous apex? I can't make out. All I do know, that's the tensor tympani, eustachian tube, uh, foot plate, facial nerve, as you can see. All I do know that it has to be cochlear, labyrinth, the junction of cochlear and labyrinth. So the only place it has to be is to be here. So I'm going to drill this point. I'm going to skip this in view of time, right? So you can see the duration of the time is taken. As I said, it's all uh, unedited videos. So I'm drilling middle cranial fossa, and I can see something moving here, this one. So now I'm going to expose that. So that looks like something white above the cochlea in front of the lab brain. So I'm going to drill and expose the matrix to see whether it's a culture trauma, and hopefully it's not a brain herniation. Okay, culture trauma. Now I can breathe peacefully. There you go. So matrix open. Now I know it's a culture trauma, and that's the petrous apex. Exactly as what the scan showed. In front of the cochlea, above the cochlea, in front of the lab brain. So the next step is to drill to expose the petrous apex. So now I'm going to drill the, the edges to expose the petrous apex and drill the, again to expose the petrous apex. And remember, as I told you before, this is an unedited video. You're seeing it exactly as how I did the surgery. It also gives you an idea of the, the time taken to do the entire surgery. So the labyrinth has been exposed. I take out the colostoma from the petrous apex, part of it anyway, to see the view, what is inside. So now I'm going to look inside the petrous apex, middle cranial fossa. That's the carotid artery. Remember the junction, the tumor was in just above the cochlea and that's the carotid artery that's pulsating there. So now I know where my enemies are. Once you know where your enemies are, so in, the, in autology is dura, ICA, the rest, you can do whatever you want. So now that I know where my enemies are, so now I'm going to drill the entire labyrinth to expose the petrous apex, yeah? As much as I can. So drill one, drill two. So now the petrous apex is exposed. So now we are going to remove, I can see into the petrous apex, there's a middle cranial fossa that has been dissected all the way to the petrous apex. That's the ICA. So now I have to remove the tumor from the colostoma from the ICA. So that's the tumor being removed from the ICA. And remember, I, uh, I'm doing it in another hospital and whatever instruments we are using is all middle ear sets. It's not even endoscopic ear set, which, which this, this hospital does not have. 
Uh, that's the causal trauma that's going to be removed from the, the middle cranial fossa. That's the carotid artery. And by using a dissector, I'm going to remove the causal trauma from the uh, uh, carotid artery. It's, I think it's important to preserve the uh, tunica adventitia of the carotid artery. There's no need to expose the entire carotid artery. Sometimes when you expose too much, the artery goes into spasm and you get, you get into unnecessary problems. Uh, you can get away 100 times. All it takes one case to screw up your whole life. So that's the carotid artery that is decent. Is that clear on the screen? Okay. So that's the cholesterol that's been removed from the carotid artery. And this is the dura, as you can see. Now I'm going to remove the cholesterol from, from the posterior margin. So again, by using... So you can see that all we are using are house elevators, which is commonly found in the middle east set. So now I'm going to go to the posterior margin and dissecting it out from the cholesterol, from the petrous apex, and the cholesterol has been removed, as you can see. That's coming from the petrous apex. So now I'm going... This is the most difficult part. I'm going to the internal auditory meatus. So I'm going to remove the part from the dura along the internal auditory meatus here. So that's the dura that is exposed. Okay? So this is now removal, middle cranial fossa, carotid artery pulsation here, here. Can you see, guys? You guys are awake, right? Okay, good. So, so now I'm going to remove the colchostoma along, this is the labyrinth. So I know that the IAM is here. I know the IAM is completely compressed and the posterior cranial fossa is also exposed by the colostoma as well. So I'm going to now dissect and that's the dura as you can see. Okay, so this is a zero degree scope. So this is zero degree scope now. Tympanic membrane, eustachian tube opening, facial nerve. And now, middle cranial fossa, the petrous apex that is quite nice and clear, the carotid artery. There's a carotid artery pulsating, which is free of colostoma as well. Okay? The prob looks nice, right? This is the bone. This is not colostoma, this is the bone. And that's the middle cranial fossa. It is the posterior cranial fossa deal with the IAM. Looked nice. I was very happy. I said, okay, good. I've got a nice video to show in uh, Talagon. Let's talk. So my colleagues took a 30-degree scope and said, let's have a better look. That's the carotid artery. Clear? No colostoma. Go back. This is Peter's bone. That is the dura of the, of the middle cranial fossa, posterior cranial fossa, sinodural angle, and they found there was a cholesterol along the internal auditory meatus. Hi, I shouldn't have used a 30 degree scope. Should have just used a zero degree scope and be happy. So now I had to drill and expose the fundus of the IAM. So once we are able to see, then by using, I tried to use a suction of the matrix, but it wasn't successful. Then I, start, I used a house elevator to remove the colostoma from the IAM, the mate from the IAM. I started having minute CSF leaks, which is the last thing I wanted. It's no fun having a CSF leak when you're having colostoma. So once I have a minute CSF leak, I told myself, well, what's the point? I'm going to reconstruct anyway. I might as well take out the whole thing. So as I Try to take out the remaining of the of the colostoma along the IAM, and the colostoma is out. What is left behind is just the glial tissue along the internal auditory meatus, and what I get is a lovely, lovely CSF leak. So, the good thing about the CSF leak is it flushes out all the colostomas, though. So you can see whatever remnant colostoma was there is being flushed out very nicely by the CSF leak. So now the problem is I've removed as much matrix as I can. Most of this may be glial tissue. Now we will have to uh, repair this defect. It'd be so much easier if we have, that's the carotid artery here, as you can see. It would have been so much easier if we have just done a blind side closure and put a big chunk of fat 
which I didn't have consent for. So the good thing about the CSF leak was it helped me to remove whatever little cholesterol that was left behind and gave me a very nice view of the pituitary apex of the ICA, of the middle cranial fossa, of the posterior cranial fossa, as you can see. Uh, and that is the, the, the glial tissue around it. So what I did was eventually I just put cholesterol again. That is the middle cranial fossa, posterior cranial fossa. That's the defect. I just put a piece of bone wax over the two bones. And that stopped the CSF leak very nicely. Whether it's going to leak again, I'm not sure. Whether it's going to work, I'm not sure. But this is the view with a zero degree scope and remove the remaining middle cranial fossa, carotid artery, ICA, as you can see. That is so the, the bone wax is only along the two ledges of the bone covering the defect. Yeah. This is the view with a 30 degree scope. Middle cranial fossa exposed all the way. The view of the carotid artery. The view of the middle cranial fossa, posterior cranial fossa, sinodual angle, and the bone wax. So I just put a fissure over this and I left, fill up the rest with the gel foam. He didn't leak after surgery. I don't know whether it's going to recur or not, but I left the whole cavity open. When I come next year, if I get invited again next year, I will show you the cavity, and I'll show you whether the tumor recurs again or not. So let's, let's go to my last two videos of endoscopic intraquinosis. So it's a patient who came with a large cyst and a seventh nerve palsy. Can you imagine? This patient actually had a seventh nerve palsy because of this cyst. Look at the normal IAM. And look at the seventh nerve that is being stretched here. So in this case, what we did was we did a small retrosigmoid. So, so this is the, 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 the retrosigmoid that I drilled. So I drill a retrosigmoid that is the size of a micro patty, which is one by one centimeters. So that's all we did. One by one centimeter opening. And then we put in a small patty. I, I held the scope while my neurosurgeon opened up the cyst. That's the cyst that has been opened, as you can see, and being dissected away. And this is the final view that you get. There's a fifth nerve, there's a seventh nerve here. And that's the, can you see how the multiple rootlets of 11, nine and 10, multiple rootlets of 11, and you can see how the ninth and 10 is being compressed along the ledge. That's the choroid plexus, and that takes you to the third ventricle. Look at the view that you get with an endoscope. You will not get a view that shows you five, seven and eight, nine, 10, multiple rootlets of 11, choroid plexus with in one sitting. This is the view that you get, okay? Then we did this surgery. It's a patient who came with imbalance. And uh, if you look at the scan, there's a cyst that compressed the brainstem. So uh, we did the whole thing uh, with image guidance. Again, I gave an opening that is uh, 1.1 centimeter or two by two centimeter maximum. Then we, again, the dura is open, free hand retraction, very little retraction that you require. And this is the view that you get. You can see the cyst along the CP angle. So now the cyst is being opened with a scissors. You can, that's the inferior part this is the inferior portion of the cyst. Can you see, guys? There's a cyst along the brainstem. That's the inferior portion. So once we open up the cyst and we release the fluid, we multiplies the whole thing with an endoscope, we are literally were able to lift the lower part of the cyst from the brainstem itself. So once we had done that, we started opening up the cyst. That's the lower part of the cyst along the brainstem. And you can literally see the basilar artery at the end as well. And you can see the multiple rootlets inferiorly. This is the final view. We're gonna take off the cyst along the fifth nerve, the ICA, the seven and eight complex, the, the seven and eight complex, the fifth nerve and the ICA, the seven and eight complex here. And here you can see the lower cranial nerves and the basilar artery going down. And look at the opening size. The opening size is two by two centimeters. And by using a bone pate, 
we were able to close the whole surgery. So this is how I think the future is going to be. Everything is going to be one by one centimeter, two by two centimeter, retro sigmoid with an endoscope, and the surgery takes one, one and a half hours, the patient is well. One of the most difficult things is a test of musician tube patency. And I think this lady from India has found a solution. So maybe we should employ this as a musician tube patency test uh, in the future as well. Yeah. So life is already complicated. Let's keep work and surgery simple. And I'll be hosting the ninth World Congress for Endoscopic Surgery of the Sinuses, Skull Base, Brain, and Spine in April 2024. Uh, I would love to see all of you there and let me be able to repay, to repay the hospitality that you have shown us. Uh, and again, thank you very much for your kind attention. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here. And thank you for the honor of giving the oration. Thank you, Dr. Prepagaran. I request the moderators, Dr. Roival and Dr. Sonore to honor Dr. Prepagaran, the center. Wait, 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 both of you. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to present a memento to Dr. Sonore and Dr. Roiva. Dr. Sonole is head of the department of the prestigious Bizet Government Medical College, Pune. Thank you. Dr. Raival is a friend of mine. He is a national and international faculty on the subject of vertigo. He travels all over India and other countries also in the subject of vertigo. We come to the third and final memorial oration. It is on the name of late Mr. Ramkrishna V. Parab. For this session, I invite Dr. Sudhir Balerao, Dr. Devi Prasad, and Dr. Prahlad Baswan Tappa as chairpersons. I call upon Dr. Sapna Parab. This lecture will be delivered by Professor Daniel Mar Marcioni. Sir, please come on the stage. I request Dr. Sapna to honor Dr. Daniel and speak a few words about late Ramkrishna V. Parap, Mr. Just one minute, sir. Dr. Sapna, please honor. Uh, Dr. Sabna to speak a few words about uh, late Mr. Ramkrishna V. Parab. Indeed, a very emotional moment for me. My words are fumbling. 
टुडे वेन आई रिमेंबर माय फादर इट जस्ट टू डेज बैक इट वाज इज सिक्स एनिवर्सरी माय फादर वाज अ मैन ऑफ एंड्यूरेंस सब्सटेंस इंटेग्रिटी एंड डिसिप्लिन टुडे वेन आई रिमेंबर हिम आई फील वी आर नथिंग इट्स जस्ट फाइव परसेंट ऑफ हिज क्वालिटीज वॉट वी हैव इम्बाइड ऑल ओवर दिस इयर्स He had a very tough journey of life without his parents right from childhood. He was born in Shiroda, which is a small place in Maharashtra, and then at a very young age of fifteen, he came to Vasco Goa and then married my mother. And uh, he had four children, including though he was just educated up to ten standard in Marathi medium, he had a great vision to educate all his children who turned out to be my. brother he is a lawyer my sister is a professor and myself a uh, surgeon so when i remember him like a uh, little bit emotional but yes he used to love singing he used to recite um, poems as well as love uh, abhangas uh, he had lot of good qualities like he was very disciplined hard working dedicated sincere and what he has taught us is all loving caring and sharing daddy i'm really miss you let's start the road So thank you very much. It's a really a honor to do the oration, and so this oration is dedicated to the father. Thank you very much, and I would like to thank you very much, uh, everybody here, and uh, Dr. Mubarak, and um, this oration regarding uh, the endoscopic and microscopic lateral skull base. because uh, we during this day we we were speaking about endoscopic ear surgery but when we are speaking about lateral skull base we have to realize that lateral skull base is a really complicated area and anatomy and of course uh, we don't forget that we are a surgeon of the ear and not a surgeon of the tool i'm not endoscopic ear surgeon i'm not a microscopic ear surgeon i'm a ear surgeon so it's really important to know that we have a different kind of uh, tools and we have to use and when you are the best when you are able to reach the same skill with all the tool available so if you can reach the same skill with the microscope with the endoscope and with the exoscope you can choose your tool for your patients depending of the dimensions of the tumor depending of the localizations of the tumor and the conditions of the patients so now for lateral skull base we can we have to use the endoscope we have to use the microscope and the exoscope in the lateral skull base one of the most famous and the common approaches is the transtemporal approach is a translabyrinthine approach so it's mean that you can use the mastoid as a natural corridor in order to reach the posterior fossa and internal auditory canal to remove tumor like this you can see this is an acoustic tumor spreading from the fundus of the internal auditory canal to the cerebellar pontine angle this is a cost number 3 and in order to remove this kind of tumor it's a microscopic approach and is a translabyrinthine approach 
So the trans-labyrinthine approach is an approach requiring the use of the microscope. <coughs> you have to dissect um, in an appropriate way all the mastoid, maintaining the posterior wall of the canal. It's really important to uncover the dura of the middle fossa and uncover the dura or of the posterior fossa and the lateral uh, sinus. You have to remove the angle between the sinus and the dura. This is really important because you have to decompress the dura, you have to decompress the sinus just in order to work inside the cerebellar pontinangle. If you don't decompress the dura and the sinus, you are not able working inside the cerebellar pontinangle. And after you have to looking for the facial nerve, in this case, we, we are doing also posterior tympanotomy because in this case, we are doing a cochlear implant in the same stage that tumor removal. And you can see the facial nerve, the facial nerve in the mastoid segment is here. This is the lateral semicircular canal, the posterior semicircular canal, the superior semicircular canal. We have to maintain the bone here on the facial nerve and you have to uncover the internal auditory canal. So you can see the bone removal. And we can start to remove all the bone between the dura of the posterior fossa and the internal auditory canal. We can see here the fundus of the internal auditory canal. And this is the porus of the internal auditory canal. We can start to cut the dura of the posterior fossa and after we can remove the tumor. In a case like this, we can try to do also cochlear implant in the same stage. In order to do this, you have to move the instrument in a really soft way, detaching the tumor from the facial nerve, maintaining the cochlear nerve, using the cotonoid, avoiding the bipolar in order to avoid the lesion of the fundus, especially for the vascularizations of the nerves. And this is the results. And you can see endoscopically the cochlear nerve entering into the cochlea. That is quite good. And this is the entry zone through geminal nerves and our cochleostomy. We are doing a cochleostomy and we can put the cochlear implant. This is wherever it is possible to remove the tumor and try to restore the hearing. It's not always possible. It's possible just in few cases, especially if you have a small tumor <laughs> in a patient with the neurosensorial hearing loss. In, th in that cases, we can try to do this. The other most common approach is the retrosigmoid approach. The retrosigmoid approach is an incomplete approach because uh, when you are doing a retrosigmoid approach, you can have a wide view on the cerebellar pontine angle, but a really a poor view inside the fundus of the internal auditory canal. So microscopically, the retrosigmoid approach is not a complete approach. It's the most famous approach for the neurosurgeon, but for our idea, the retrosigmoid approach, we use especially with a large tumor located just in the cerebellar pontine angle. If you want to use the retrosigmoid approach in a tumor spreading also in the fundus of the internal auditory canal, now we can use the endoscope. So it's a retrosigmoid endoscopic assisted surgery. So with the 45 degree endoscope, you can manage the fundus of the internal auditory canal in order to remove the tumor from the fundus. This is a traditional craniotomy. We saw also in the lecture before, you have to cut the dura in order to decompress and after you have looking for the cisterna magna in order to have a decompression of the brain in order to push a little bit in a gentle way the cerebellum. This approach, you can have some morbidity, especially if you have a large tumor 
with the hypertension inside the brain because sometimes it's not so easy to do the decompressions. And you can see after the decompression, you can see the tumor in the cerebellar pontine angle and uh, you have to cut the arachnoidal layer around the tumor and after you can start the decompressions of the tumor. You have to do the, the bulk in the central part of the tumor here in order to reduce the mass of the tumor. And after you can detach the tumor from the structures. Which kind of structure we can see? This is the porous of the internal auditory canal. You can see that this is the dura. We are doing the dura layer. And after we can drill just a little bit the porous. And after we are doing a central debunking of the tumor. And after we have to detach the wall of the tumor from the trigeminal nerve in the superior aspect and the lower cranial nerve in the lower aspect of the um, cerebellum pontinangle. The problem is when you are doing the uh, microscopic part of the uh, fundus of the internal auditory canal. You can see this is the endoscope. You can see the facial nerve. And here you are exposing the tumor in the fundus of the internal auditory canal. And instead here, this is the microscopic view. And you can see the microscopic view. You are not able to see what's happened under here. You can drill more, but you are not able to see in the fundus. Just using a 45 degree endoscope or a 70 degree endoscope and you are able to remove the tumor from the fundus. You can see this is the facial nerve. This is the fundus of the internal auditory canal. And so just in this way, the dissections of the tumor is complete. If you don't do this, you can leave a residual disease in the fundus of the internal auditory canal. So it's really important to use the endoscopic support during retrosigmoid. The endoscope is also really useful if you want to do a surgery in a case like this. You can see this was a large epidermoid tumor in the cerebellum pontine angle located in the middle line after microscopic work. This is the endoscopic check and is really important to looking for the fragment of the skin because it's like a cholestatoma of the cerebellum pontine angle. This is the six cranial nerves with the Dorello canal. This is the acoustic facial, the trigeminal nerve. And look here, this is third portions of the cranial nerve. And this is the pituitary stalk in the chiasm. The chiasm, the optic nerve in the right side, the optic nerve in the left, and the pituitary stalk. So it means that you can reach the contralateral sides through the endoscope. And so it's really great advantages. And look at the view of the midline and the chiasm here through the retrosigmoid approach here. And it's really important to expect all the cavity. You can see that between the third cranial nerve and the tentorium, you can see a residual disease and you can remove them in order to eradicate totally the lesion. So the endoscopic approach in um, a retrosteroid approach is of, of, of course, today it's mandatory. What about uh, the uh, transotic and transcochlear approach? Transotic and transcochlear approach are two different approach, but with the same principle. In the transotic approach, you have to maintain the facial nerve in the bony canal, and you have to remove all the temporal bone in order to reach the most deepest part of the temporal bone, managing the lesion around the carotid artery and around, of course, like you can see this lesion 
but you have to maintain the facial nerve on place. Instead, in transcochlear approach, nowadays we don't use unless the patient has already a facial palsy because in the transcochlear approach, you have to perform a posterior routing of the facial nerve. It means that you can cause a facial palsy of the patient and the posterior routing is not like the anterior routing. The posterior routing, the result is worse. And so the facial nerve is gone. So we can use uh, the transcochlear when the facial nerve is gone before the surgery, just in that case. When we are using uh, the transotic approach, I'm using the transotic approach when you have a lesion so vast that we have no choice, it's not possible to use just the endoscope. Look, this patient, this was a baby with a huge cholesterol granuloma causing a, a profound neurosensual hearing loss, vertigo, and six cranial nerve palsy. And this was a, a eight years old baby. And you can see here the evolution. Of course, you can use the endoscope opening here, but what's happened after some years? You have again performing a surgery and again performing a surgery. And which kind of life these children can have with this lesion? So if you have already a profound neurosensual hearing loss, you can use also the transotic approach with the infratemporal fossa type B in order to remove this cholesterol granuloma. But if you choose this approach, you have to detach the capsule of the cholesterol granuloma in order to remove totally, in order to solve the problem of the patient for the life of the patient. It's not so easy because you have to maintain the facial nerve in the canal. You have to skeletonize the carotid artery and after removing all the tumor. You can see now here the condition. And so we decided to do the transotic with infratemporal force approach in order to remove totally the tumor. And we can start with the closure of the sternal auditory canal. You can see here, this is the canal. We have to close. And after you have to go to the neck and in order to isolate the carotid artery, the internal carotid artery and the jugular vein, because if you have a problem during the dissection, you are able to close and you're able to manage. And you can see here, this is the, the gastric, the carotid, the jugular vein, and we are following the lower cranial nerves. And after you have to following the parotid here, looking for the facial nerve in, in the parotid. This is the external auditory canal that we have to close. And after you have to, the facial nerve is over there. And uh, we have to uncover the temporal bone and we can start our approach. This is a microscopic based approach, but we don't forget that we need to use the microscope always. I spend my life to fight with a microscopic surgeon just to encourage to use the endoscope. I don't want to spend a life to encourage endoscopic surgery to use the microscope. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> anyway, and this is uh, the, the, the view. The middle fossa is here. This is the lateral sinus. The external auditory canal is over there. You have to detach over there. This is the facial nerve in the parotid gland. And after you can start the dissection, it's really important to remove all the bone, maintaining just the soft tissue. So the middle fossa, the posterior fossa, and after you have to remove the external auditory canal. You can see the facial nerve is here, incus, the labyrinthine block, and this is the canal that we have to remove. 
the facial nerve is this. You can do the retrofacial cells approach. And after we can start to see the jugular bulb is over there. And you can see that you are not able to see the tumor just now because the tumor is all inside the petrus apex and you can remove the bone. And this is the incus, the malleus, and you have to remove all the bone in the anterior aspect of the external auditory canal. And this is the parotid. And after we can start to drill, and you can see you have to remove um, the ossicular chain like we did with the endoscopic approach. And you can see the facial nerve, the cochlariform process. You have to do the uh, labyrinthectomy, the facial nerve, lateral semicircular canal, superior semicircular canal, posterior semicircular canal. And you have to remove all this labyrinthine block in order to reach the internal auditory canal and after you can start to see the cyst. So it's really important. You can see, we can start to see something here. Look, this is the wall of the cyst. We can start to see, but we must be careful. Look, the cyst is from here to here. So you have to remove all the bone over there. This is the temporal mandibular joint. And after we can see here, the limit of the cyst between the middle fossa and, and the tumor. And this is the internal auditory canal that was pushed from the cyst laterally because the cyst was huge. And after this, you can see the facial nerve is this internal auditory canal. You have to detach the cyst from the internal auditory canal, removing all the bone. And uh, we have to looking for the capsule of the cyst. Now we can see here the cyst. We need to see the carotid artery. So we have to remove all the bone over there. And we can start to see the carotid is here the vertical portions of the carotid and the facial nerve is over there. This is the carotid and it's not sufficient. You have to remove all the bone anteriorly and in the horizontal portions of the carotid. This is the GSPN. It's a really meticulous work in order to see all the anatomy to the temporal bone. And you can see that we can start with the touch over there, carotid, vertical, horizontal, facial nerve, the anterior part of the, the, the cyst is here under the carotid. And the GSPN is here, facial nerve, carotid, and internal auditory canal. And so we have to detach the capsule of the cyst from the bone. And after you have to remove, um, you can see one part of the cyst and the second part of the cyst, but you are able to see that was a total removal because you was able to remove it totally. You can check endoscopically, but we were lucky. Everything was gone. This is because you was able to following the anatomy of the carotid and the facial nerve with the microscope. We must be honest. The microscope is a great tool like the endoscope. And in this case, no sense to do just a opening that you have to do again, again, again in the life of the patient, especially if the patient lost the hearing function. Another patient like this, you can see, this is a cholestatoma. Look at the cholestatoma and look at the carotid. Of course, in a cholestatoma like this, it's quite difficult to say, okay, I can do everything with the endoscope. You have to use the microscope. In this case, the patient is about 50 years old without a good facial nerve function. He lost completely the functioning of the facial nerve. And the only way to treat this patient is the transcochlear approach, but not only transcochlear approach is possible. In this case, you have to use the endoscope. 
you have to use the endoscope around the carotid artery. If you don't use the endoscope, in this case, it's quite difficult to have the radicality of the lesion around the carotid. So this is the patient. Also, if you use the endoscope, you have to check during the time because you can have a residual disease and developing again cholesterol during the time. But of course, is the best way that we can do today. The conjunction between the microscopic approach and endoscopic support around the carotid. You can see again the neck. This is all the cholecytoma. Please, when you are this, don't think about the cholecytoma. Think about the anatomy. You have to uncover. Look, the carotid is with all the epidermidation. You have to uncover the dura. You have to expose the lateral sinus. You have to see the dura of the posterior fossa. You have to see the internal auditory canal. And look, the carotid with the epidermization, you have to drill all around the carotid. And after, when you see all the anatomy, think about to remove the residual disease on the carotid. One of the best way to remove the fragment of the skin along the carotid is to use the cotonoid just scraping around with the uh, water over the cotonoid like this, and you can see that you are able to see the plane. And under the carotid, here you have to use the, the endoscope. It's not possible to use the microscope, but check with the endoscope what's happened under the carotid and removing the fragment of the cholestatoma around the carotid. This is the vertical portions. This is the horizontal portions. This is the anterior lacerum foramen. And after you can use also a 45 degree endoscope to check and you can change the, the scope and the angle of the scope. So it's really important in this case, um, the using of the endoscope to check all around the structure, but is a microscopic basic work, of course. We can have also a tumor like this, for example, tumor of the facial nerve. You can see this is a tumor of the facial nerve and entering into the middle fossa in a patient with already a facial palsy grade four. And this was a, a, a hemangioma of the facial nerve. In a case like this, we planted a endoscopic approach for a small tumor of the facial nerve, but this is too big. So in this case, we need a middle fossa in combined with the endoscope. Why middle fossa? Because we can try to avoid the, the uh, neurosensual hearing loss. We can try to preserve the hearing function. And the only way to preserve the hearing function is working above here. So we have to do a middle fossa, and in this case, you have to do a craniotomy. It's a traditional craniotomy because there is no honest, I'm really honest, I want to say that if you do a small craniotomy, is you have less morbidity. It's not right, honestly. You can do a four by four craniotomy, and it's the same that you can do a one by one. Because the problem is how to manage and how to move the instrument inside the brain. If you have a large craniotomy, you can use a two hand and you can manage everything. If you have a, just a small corridor, sometimes, honestly, is I, I'm speaking about my experience. I had some complication in the smaller craniotomy with respect to the large, but this is my experience. And you can see the hemangioma in the petrus apex, and this is the facial nerve, and the labyrinthine portions of the facial nerve is here, this is the incus. You have to remove all this bone because in the hemangioma, you have uh, uh, reactions of the bone over the genicular ganglia, is always like this. And you have to cut, and you can see there how his other end with the dura. And when you remove all the tumor, you can repair the facial nerve with the graft. 
I'm using the great auricular nerve graft and I can put the graft between the labyrinthine, the labyrinthine portions of the facial nerve and the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. This is the malleus, the hincus, and uh, this is the internal auditory canal. And after the uh, microscopic work, we can check the graft. Final view is here. And we can check endoscopically. And this is the defect of the facial nerve. And we can put the graft in order to reconstruct the facial nerve. What about the result of the facial nerve? When you put the graft, if you are lucky, if you reach the grade number three, the grade number three is already a good result. After you can work with the patient, with the speech therapist in our department, we have a facial nerve office with a really clever speech therapist for the exercise of the facial nerve. And I think that they support is the best, honestly. Again, we can have also infratemporal force. Infratemporal force approach, we can divide infratemporal force type A, type B, type C, et cetera. What we must know because we can have to treat some patient and sometimes it's quite difficult to select infratemporal force type A approach because in the infratemporal fossa, in order to reach the foramen lacerum and all the disease, you have to do the anterior rerouting of the facial nerve. So you can see this tumor is a tumor spreading from the cerebellum pontine angle. Oh, wow. I don't know, I don't know what's happened, probably. Okay, it's, it's back. I don't know what's happened. You can see this is a, a schwannoma from the cerebellum pontine angle spreading in the petrus apex along the foramen lacerum and going inside the infratemporal fossa. So it's really large tumor. It was a young lady and the only symptom was the vertigo. So it was a shock for her. So she asked a solution because uh, of course, this tumor was really huge. But before to do the surgery, you must know exactly the condition of the carotid. You have to do the angiography. You have to see the condition of the carotid and please do the balloon test occlusion. The balloon test occlusion can save your life because you know if there is a compensation in the contralateral side or if you have no compensation. Because if you have no compensation, think about to treat, especially in not so experienced surgeon, because if you have a problem on the carotid, you have a really big problem. Instead, if the balloon occlusion, you can have a compensation in the contralateral side, you know that you can close the carotid and you have no huge problem. Of course, this is the approach. And in this case, we did one stage. You know that for infratemporal force approach, when you have a tumor located in the cerebellum pontine angle till the infratemporal fossa, you can use a two-stage approach. The first is the extradural approach, and after six months, you can do the intradural approach. In these cases, we do a infratemporal fossa type A with transsigmoid approach in order to remove totally the tumor in the same stage. Again, this is the facial nerve, and now we can start the removal of the tumor. You can see the tumor here, the carotid is here, and we have to remove all the, the um, to do a subtotal petrosectomy. In this case, you can preserve the hearing because you're maintaining the labyrinthine block and the cochlea, but you need to perform the anterior rerouting of the facial nerve. It's really important to have a irrigation, always irrigated on the facial nerve, a really soft movement. And if you are lucky working on this case, 
you need a good electrophysiologist, you need a, a good speech therapist, but you can reach grade two also of the facial nerve palsy. Of course, it's not always like this. In this case, we were lucky. We were able to you to reach a grade two. You can see this is the infratemporal fossa removal of the tumor, and it's really important to leave integrum the uh, lower cranial nerve because if you create a deficit of the lower cranial nerve, it's worse with respect to facial nerve palsy. Especially the glossopharyngeal nerve in the older patients is a terrible condition and is really difficult to have as swelling. And sometimes you need a, a nasogastric tube for a lot of time, so it's not a joke. So it's really important to protect the lower cranial nerve, maintaining the middle, part of the jugular vein. And this is the part, the last part of the tumor located in the cerebellopontine angle. And we are doing the transigmoid approach and after the tumor is gone. And so you can see the sac and this is the tumor from the brainstem. This is another disaster you can see uh, a large meningioma in a patient with uh, uh, he no hearing function, with the vertigo, with the facial palsy. And so also in this case, uh, we did a, a infratemporal fossa, but I don't want to uh, an, another disaster like this. Uh, in this case, we did a infratemporal fossa type C. So it's really important to see the anatomy of the carotid and to remove totally the bone anteriorly with respect to the carotid. What about the endoscope, total endoscopic approach? Of course, exists. But this corridor, this is the transcanal, transpromotorial corridors, we designed especially for tumor located here. And we saw that the tumor can be here, can be here, can be here. If you have just a tumor located here, why? You have to destroy all the temporal bones just to reach this small area in the internal vitreous canal. So we thought about the anterior skull base. Nowadays, to reach some area, we can use the nose as a natural corridor in order to reach the disease in the anterior skull base. And this is the same for the ear, but for the ear, we can use especially for the internal auditory canal and from the fundus of the internal auditory canal. And uh, this is our work about uh, the endoscopic transcanal corridor to lateral skull base. And when you have a patient like this, that you have a tumor just in the internal auditory canal, the first choice is the weight and scan. But if you have a younger people with a tumor growing, with a vertigo, without hearing function, with the indication of the surgery, why you have to perform a large approach just to reach through the external auditory canal and you're working just on the tumor and not on the brain. So it's a totally different approach. For example, this is a typical example of intralabyrinthine tumor um, yes, I don't know why, like this. Okay, and we can start the surgery. This is an intralabyrinthine tumor, so a small tumor, but the patient was really young with a lot of vertigo. We tried to use uh, drugs without any response, and so the indication was for the surgery. You have to detach all the skin and the eardrum you know, like in the dissection yesterday. And you can see clearly now the anatomy. You see, this is the eardrum with the skin. You can see the malleus, the second tube, the carotid artery, and the incus and the stapes, and round window, the fustis, finiculus, subiculum. <laughs> we know everything now. We have to enlarge the external auditory canal with the drill in order to have 
the good uh, way to reach the internal auditory canal. We are using more and more piezo surgery device because for us it's really important. This is the stapes and this is the facial nerve. And uh, we can see the ossicular chain and we have to remove the incus, to remove the malleus. This surgery, you can use also the older. Probably with the older is good. Mubarak, you have to think about. Anyway, this is the facial nerve, lateral semicircular canal, and the stapes is here, and cochlear reform process, and you can see immediately the facial nerve, of course, and the Jacobson nerve running over the promontory region, turn under the cochlear reform process, and after we can start to remove um, the stapes. Look, this is the lateral semicircular canal, and Jacobson nerve. The tumor was under the vestibule spreading in the canal. Just removing the stapes when you have intralabyrinthine tumor, and you can see immediately the tumor. The tumor is here. This is the tumor inside the vestibule. And you can see very clearly. So we can start to enlarge the vestibule entering into the cochlea. Mm, you can see with the piezo surgery, you can have in front of you the facial nerve. And look what's happened. You can see the scala tympani and the scala vestibuli connecting with the vestibule and the tumor. The scala tympani, scala vestibuli. This is the subcochlear canalicoli. And after you have to enlarge more and more, and you can see better. Look at the architecture of the basal cern of the cochlea and the tumor. You can use also the lateral semicircular canal opening just in order to detach the superior aspect of the tumor working around the facial nerve. You can see the tumor is here, the blue line of the lateral semicircular canal, because uh, I don't want to have a hidden area when you are using the endoscope, so you have to see. And uh, look, we are reaching the superior aspect of the canal. We have to enlarge just a little bit more in order to detach the tumor from the lateral semicircular canal. And after we can detach the tumor from here and from here, you see? And the facial nerve is in the canal. It's really nice because you can use also 45 degree endoscope and working along the facial nerve. And you can see here the tumor that is gone now. This is the first part. The second part of the tumor is inside the internal auditory canal uh, in the fundus. So this is the, the first part. This is basal cern of the cochlea. And we can check all the anatomy. Also, with the, you can see this is the, um, the, the, uh, uh, the utriculum here. And this is the spherical recess. Spherical recess, elliptical recess, utriculum and with the angular uh, suction. And after you can use a 45 degree. Look now the view of the vestibule with the 45 degree. We, we can check better from above and under the facial nerve, 45 degree, cochlear reform process, facial nerve. Look, posterior canal, superior canal. And after we can start the removal of the tumor in the fundus of the interodict canal. And we have to do like yesterday, we have to open the cochlea in the middle and apical turn, and we have to remove the cochlear vestibular bone. So we can start just now. I just want to go a little bit more. Okay. Oh, I don't know what's happened. Okay, so you can see this is the vestibule, this is the cochlea, this is the cochlear vestibular bone, and this is the facial nerve. We have to remove more bone in order to see the cochlea. Middle, endapical turn of the cochlea, basal turn of the cochlea, vestibule, cochlear vestibular bone. You have to remove this bone in order to enter into the fundus of the internal auditory canal. And after you have the last piece of the tumor and you can remove, you can see, this is the last piece of the tumor in the fundus. And now 
you can remove and you can use also two hands like the arterioscal base one assistant can hold the endoscope and you can use a two hand in order to detach the last piece of the tumor from the nerves so it's not one hand it is two hand technique with the use of the assistant and you can see all the, the approach this is the cochlea the facial nerve is run over there you have to close the second tube and you can use a pedicle flap, the muscular flap to detach the cochlear from process and you have used the uh, malleus, the, the muscle of the malleus in order to close the second tube. And after you put the fat in order to close the defect of the antenna of the toy canal, and you have to reverse the skin in order to close the external auditory canal. This is the transpermontorial technique, endoscopically. You can use the transpermontorial approach also with the microscope. This is the enlarged transpermontorial approach for tumor like this. You can see this is the same anatomy with the endoscope, but under microscopic view. This is the tumor. We can see now all the facial nerve. And this is the cavity at the end of the surgery after the removal of the tumor. So it's mean that also microscopically is possible. So nowadays, lateral skull base, we don't think about the tool. We have to think about the disease. We have to think about where is located the disease, the dimensions of the disease, the hearing of the patient, the condition of the patient. And you have to use all the instruments that you need in order to do the target. The target is the removal of the tumor for the benefit of the patient. So we have the microscope, we have the endoscope, we have both the combination of the instruments and nowadays the exoscope. This was my experience, and this is uh, my last book regarding this experience in endoscopic lateral skull base with all the anatomy and the principle and approaches. And I would like to invite you in Modena just to continue to ex exchange a program between me and you. And in our international workshop on and ear surgery that we will perform a lot of uh, transcanal endoscopic approach, microscopic, exoscopic, lateral skull base surgeries. And immediately after, if you want, we are doing a, a dissection course of infratemporal fossa approach type A. Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daniel. I request Dr. Mubarak to honor Professor Daniel. <laughs> I request moderator Dr. Sudhir Bhalera to hand over the certificate to. On behalf of the organizing committee, we would like to felicitate Dr. Sudhir Bhalerao. He is a dynamic ENT surgeon working at Akurdi, the office bearer of Indian Medical Association, as well as the treasurer of ISOCOL, which is for at Medical College in Mangalore, and he as you know, he is the vice president of COCOL. Thank you. So we had a wonderful day today. Uh, we'll, we'll assemble back at about 8.30. Uh, one photo for all three. Get ready, sir, please, sir.
Thank you. 